Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Biologically Speaking webinar series. I'm Seanak, a postdoctoral fellow at the National Cancer Institute at NIH, and also co-founder of this academic interest group. We have recently completed one year of our journey, but if you're tuning into this series for the first time, uh, beyond hosting scientific talks, we also present blog posts for general public. So if you'd like to write for us or share your science story, please contact us via our website at www.biologicallyspeaking.com. And if you'd like to get updated information of future talks, please follow us on Twitter and on our YouTube channel. All our talks are archived on our YouTube channel, so you can visit and listen to the talks anytime you want. And before we begin today's session, a couple of housekeeping things to keep in mind. Uh, please keep your microphone muted and video turned off in order to uh, keep the bandwidth for the session. And you can post your questions for our speaker using the chat box, and we will moderate them at the end of today's session. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mohit Kumar Jolly, who is currently an assistant professor at Center for Biosystems Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He received his BTEC and MTech from IIT Kanpur, where he focused on understanding planar cell polarity in the sophila wing epithelium using mathematical models. His ardent interest coupling mathematics and biology led him to earn his PhD degree in bioengineering in 2016 from Rice University at Houston, Texas in the United States, where he investigated the presence of hybrid epithelial to mesenchymal phenotypes in cancer metastasis. He did his postdoctoral training from the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics at Rice University and was also appointed as a computational cancer biology fellow in 2017. He went back to India with Ramanujan Fellowship from DST India to start his independent laboratory at the Indian Institute of Science in 2018, where he is currently an assistant professor. And his lab is interested in quantitative understanding of cellular decision making in development and disease and studying epithelial to mesenchymal plasticity to better model therapeutic targets. Dr. Jolly is appointed as the Infosys Young Investigator at IISC from 2020 and also an adjunct faculty at Queensland University of Technology, Australia. Mohit received numerous awards, including the Ramanujan Fellowship from the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, the iBiology Young Scientist Series in 2016, Tata Trust Travel Award in 2019, to name a few. Over the years, he and his lab has contributed immensely to the field of epithelial to mesenchymal transition and has developed mathematical models to understand the EMT dynamics. Apart from being an amazing scientist, he's an excellent science communicator who has recently started sharing science memes. So those who are interested, please go and follow him on Twitter. Trust me, you will enjoy it. He is passionate about science outreach and is also affiliated with the Center for Society and Policy at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. With that, thank you very much, Mohit, for agreeing to speak on our platform and a warm welcome to you on Biologically Speaking and very much looking forward to your interesting story. Over to you. Thank you so much, Shana, for that kind, very kind introduction and the kind invitation to share some of our work at this exciting webinar series, which I've been following for quite some time. And many, many congratulations for completing one year. I think this is a fantastic uh, science communication initiative, and I wish you all, all the very best and happy to contribute in whichever manner uh, you might deem fit. So I'll just share my screen and... Is my screen visible? Yes, all good. Great, thanks. Thanks, thanks once again, uh, Shamak. So I'll share some of the uh, aspects that we have been working on in, in our lab. And I've come from a physics training during my PhD. And as physicists uh, want to think about common principles that govern various different systems, uh, my effort is in trying to understand are there some common principles across different cancers in terms of how they metastasize or in terms of how they relapse and how they resist different drugs that are thrown at them in the clinic. So today I'll be sharing examples from three different cancers of very different origins, but try to convince you that despite their molecular complexities and context specific differences, there can be some common dynamical features in terms of how they adapt and respond to stress and how we can hopefully uh, leverage understand a uh, better understanding of the, that dynamics in terms of designing uh, smarter strategies to tackle them in the clinic. So, yeah. so 
So cancer, as many of you may know it, is a disease that progresses in multiple stages. You have uh, one or more cells in earth or an organ that due to genetic or environmental or a combination of factors somehow stop following the rules of normal cells and start dividing uncontrollably as shown on the slide here in, in, in green. And that disrupts the normal architecture of a given organ, the normal function of that organ. And in many cases, cancer no longer remains spread, but actually no longer remains restricted, but actually spreads to multiple different organs in the body, a process called as metastasis. The timeline that you see here can be different for different cancers, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is the acceleration in the process that happens once the cancer begins to spread. Now, over the past a few decades, we have made some remarkable progress in diagnosing cancer early. So now there are different uh, tests, both for men and women, to screen for prostate cancer and breast cancer, respectively, after a given age. Uh, there are there is more information about big genes uh, accelerate or deaccelerate different stages of cancer, and there are uh, there is information about how lifestyle changes, such as smoking, can induce lung cancer. And all these changes or all these advancements largely restrict themselves to the initial stages of cancer progression. We have not really made any major breakthroughs in controlling or preventing metastasis, which remains the cause of uh, still 90% of all cancer-related deaths. And how cancer cells spread? They spread largely through this fantastic set of freeway uh, uh, what the blood vessels in our body. So imagine a tumor in a given organ, it would approach the nearest blood vessels available and then get onto that architecture, spread all over the body, take exits at different organs in the body, and then eventually get out and start to form tumors there as well. Now, because metastasis is such a challenging process for cells, be it the process to get out, be it the process to survive in circulation, be it the process to settle down and form a colony in a completely foreign environment, Metastasis is highly, highly inefficient process and more than 99.9% .9 of cells that actually begin this journey are not able to complete this journey and form secondary tumors. Still, there is a very small percentage of cells which are able to complete this journey and eventually lead to patient death in most of the cases. Now, if you think about this journey, then during this journey, cancer cells are facing uh, stresses which are constantly changing in time as well. So the environment around a cancer cell is never the same because if you think of the part of the journey that it takes in circulation, then at every given instance, it has a different biophysical and biochemical environment around it. And of course, it has uh, different immune cells that are trying to attack it, different drugs that are being thrown out in the clinic as well to try to kill them. So therefore, what cancer cells need to do in such process is to adapt in a fast and a reversible manner. And that is where uh, mutations, which are usually heralded and associated with different aspects of cancer progression are not very helpful because mutations are neither fast nor reversible. Mutations or the act of getting the right mutation which would help a cancer cell overcome a given barrier is a very slow process because mutations are usually associated uh, with changes at the time scale of multiple cell cycles. And one cell cycle in a mammalian cell is usually 24 hours. So if you're talking about mutations, then you would get the right mutation, say in a given gene P53 uh, of interest, that would happen at, you know, at least 10 or 100 or even more cell cycles, which you are talking about uh, a few months in circulation. And that is not how long cancer cells usually stay in circulation. The other uh, aspect about mutations is that they are not reversible. Once again, they'll be genetically passed down and there's no coming back from it. So therefore, uh, usually mutations are not really seen to be specifically enriched in a given uh, metastatic setting. Of course, there are mutations in cells which metastasize, but that those mutations often happen to be a proper subset of what is seen in the primary tumor and no new mutations specifically uniquely can be associated uh, that are developed during the process of metastasis itself. So if not mutations, then what other changes uh, which are non-mutational or non-genetic changes can actually drive metastasis? And how do they control that the changes that they are driving are fast as well as reversible in, in this particular case? Now, this idea of cell state change and its reversibility is not new to biology. 
Because initially, when we used to think about development, we used to think of it as a one directional process in which once a so called pluripotent cell or a progenitor cell has actually converted to one of the more differentiated cells, the initial thought process was that yes, that is their fate, and that's the, that's the term cell fate. Uh, which would continue. But now the term being used is cell state because we know that it can change as a function of time. Cells can go back, cells can go from one state to another under certain perturbations. And this award, uh, which uh, many of you uh, might know about this field uh, much better than I do, of induced pluripotent stem cells, which led to Nobel Prize in 2012, was showing the exact idea that you can take one of the differentiated states and push it back to becoming a stem cell. Uh, and which can then differentiate to various different uh, cell types as well. So cells can be reprogrammed and one can begin to think about cells as various other entities, say, such as water, which can exist in multiple different states at different pressure and temperature and so on. So at the same time, you do not want cells to continuously change their state. You don't want um, a lung cell to become a heart cell tomorrow morning, right? So they, while they should have the potency to uh, switch to another state, this enthusiasm needs to be controlled in nature. So this idea of plasticity or cell state switching or ability of cells to switch their phenotype in a reversible manner is what is called the idea of cellular plasticity or phenotypic plasticity. And this has been shown extensively in the field of cancer metastasis over past three to four decades, where we now know that cancer cells are continuously adapting and changing their state, not only along just one axis, but along many, many axes, as I was showing in that earlier schematic as well, be it in terms of changing their metabolism, be it in terms of changing their uh, dormancy versus proliferation status, their ability to evade the immune system or uh, be sensitive to it and so on and so forth. So the question that our lab is interested in trying to address is, how many states can cancer cells exist in? How are they switching reversibly among these states? And uh, if these axes are presumably independent or partly dependent on each other, how are they coordinating their behavior such that when they gain the ability to move, do they also necessarily gain the ability to resist drugs uh, or not? And in, in what cases they do, in what cases they do not. Now, the idea of phenotypic plasticity or this concept has one another important implication, which is non-genetic heterogeneity. So imagine that you were looking at a given population and you, uh, through fact sorting, you measure the levels of a given protein of interest. And then after that, you sort out these cells. So you segregate the uh, low X cells and high X cells, and then you just culture them in the lab. What happens in many, many cases is that this presumably homogeneous population is then able to regenerate the parental population or is then able to give rise to the other homogeneous uh, subpopulation from which you had actually segregated it. Earlier. So the system has the ability to give rise to the other state even if it does not exist at time t equals to zero, which is what is shown in, in this schematic. And this has been seen in cancer cells also in this uh, landmark study. Uh, many of the breast cancer cell lines were shown to contain cells from three different states. You segregate them, you wait for some time, and you see that they come back. Uh, this is ex uh, our experimental collaborators here at ISC have also done these experiments. But this is a different system, but nonetheless, the idea remains the same, that you segregate these cells and you wait in this particular case approximately a week, and you see that cells begin to reconstitute the parental population that they started with. So these changes are very reversible uh, in nature. Now, to the two of the three examples that I'll uh, initially start talking about are very well studied in the case of can cancer. The third one is not as well studied. I'll get to that as well towards the later half of the talk. But two of them, so one of them is um, the transition between epithelial and mesenchymal phenotype. The idea in uh, epithelial cancers or carcinomas being the following, that you have cells which are epithelial in nature. They are very tightly uh, bound to each other, they do not usually migrate or invade, but rather they gain this ability to migrate or invade during the first step of metastasis and where they lose adhesion and gain migration and this transition is called as epithelial to mesenchymal transition or EMT in short. And once they reach the other organ, they no longer need to migrate or invade, rather need to settle down and form another tumor. Um, and that is what the process of MET is called. And these cycles of EMT and MET are thought to continue and form uh, metastasis. 
Now, another example, which I'll talk about today is the case of melanoma, which is not a carcinoma, which is not an epithelial cancer to begin with. It begins in melanocytes in the skin. And they're also a very similar feature of cell switching back and forth between proliferative and invasive cell states has been reported uh, for the past 15 years. So we'll try to understand how these processes happen, what factors control the switching back and forth. So starting with EMT, the field of EMT, if you look at the uh, reviews in, uh, from that field across this uh, period of a decade, you would see these schematics showing the picture very similar to what I just showed you that epithelial cells convert to mesenchymal cells and mesenchymal cells convert back to epithelial cells. Now, the question we started asking is, is EMT really binary? Do you have only two states? And the answer to that from the experimental literature was, at that point was, of course, yes. Uh, but again, one has to be thinking uh, carefully about what type of experimental data are we looking at and claiming that there are only two states. The most common type of data that existed at that point of time was that you would take epithelial cells, treat them with some EMT inducing agent for approximately one to two weeks, come back and then see that yes, some of those cells have changed their shape, some of them have changed their molecular markers and EMT is, uh, was thought to have completed. But as you very well know from the example of the pandemic, right? if I give you only two time points, here, let's say, if you look at the, the wave in India shown in green here, if I tell you what was happening in May and what was happening in February, that doesn't tell you anything that there was a wave in between that had happened and actually passed by, right? So we need to look at multiple time points in between to actually figure out how the system was behaving. So before we uh, got that experimental data at multiple time points, we started constructing mathematical models of the phenomena from whatever information that was available at that given point of time. So what we did is we looked at the EMT literature, identified what molecules are known to drive EMT, what are known to drive MET, how do they connect to each other, and can we take that information, convert them into a set of uh, equations and see how the network behaves. So here you have two transcription factors, um, SNAIL and ZEB, which are driving a more mesenchymal profile. You have two microRNAs, uh, which are driving a more epithelial profile. So if you overexpress these, you get more epithelial. If you downregulate them, you get more mesenchymal. Those are the kinds of data that existed in multiple cell lines uh, approximately 10 years ago when we started with this. The numbers that you see here are some input output uh, relationship. These can be number of binding sites that are known from one regulator onto the other. And such models have been, had been extensively built for various different or, microorganisms, such as bacteria and yeast at that point of time. And our question was, can we apply the technology, can that technique, that set of tools to better understand what's going on in EMT and cancer. So we came up with this framework where one or more microRNAs can reversibly bind to an mRNA form this complex, which can uh, either inhibit translation or just sequester mRNA for some time or, or degrade it as well. Then you can convert this. Uh, trust me, this is the only slide with equations. I'm not going to bore you with math. Um, but what these equations tell you is the following. So each of these equations tell you how the, the rate of change of a given molecule, which is written on the right, each of them is produced at some rate, each of them is degraded at some rate, and each of them is regulated by either microRNAs or transcription factor as shown in this uh, schematic, that, uh, that the network that you see here. Long story short, what did our model predict? So here the x-axis is an EMT inducing signal and the y-axis is the measure of EMT-ness. The solid blue lines are stable states and the dot red lines are unstable states. So we'll only worry about stable states because that is what gives you uh, the, the, the phenotypes. So what you see here is that there are three stable states, an epithelial state with very low levels of ZEB, a mesenchymal state with high levels of ZEB, and a hybrid epithelial mesenchymal state, which has higher levels of ZEB than epithelial, but lower levels than that of uh, mesenchymal. So clearly stating that PMP is not binary. The other prediction that our model made is the following. Now, if you look at this graph vertically upwards, in this region, you would see there is only one, uh, if you draw a line vertically upwards, you would cross only one solid blue line, which in this case corresponds to epithelial. So therefore, if your snail levels are low, the only phenotype available is uh, epithelial. If your snail levels are very high, the only phenotype available is mesenchymal. But if your snail levels are somewhere in between, then you can actually have cells, cells can have multiple options to choose from. They can be either epithelial or hybrid or uh, mesenchymal. 
So there can be, again, this non-genetic heterogeneity that we were talking about, that cells with the same genetic background can have different phenotypes based on the dynamics of this a very small network. And of course, EMT is much more complicated than this. And we'll uh, talk about larger networks as well. But even the small network, which has many assumptions, such as ZEB1 and ZEB2 are pulled together as one node. Um, of course, there are molecular differences between them, uh, which we ignored at that point of time. But you can continue to grow this network and you uh, will not be surprised, many people have done it over the past 10 years, that you see many, many more hybrid states also coming up. So I'm not saying that there's only one hybrid state. This is what we said at that point of time with the network that we had at, um, in that first model of EMT. So those were the three predictions from our model that A, uh, cells, EMT is not binary. You can have hybrid epithelial mesenchymal states. Um, you can have non-genetic heterogeneity and uh, cells can also spontaneously switch back and forth. So if you take an epithelial cell, uh, it can, under certain conditions, switch to a mesenchymal cell even without it getting any induction uh, per se. So these were the prediction. Then we collaborated uh, with a set of uh, lung cancer, uh, experimental cancer biologists at MD Anderson and looked at it in this particular cell line where E. cadherin and Vimentium, the canonical epithelial and mesenchymal proteins have been stained with red and green. So you can see that in this image uh, that most cells actually express both red and green together. And they continue to do that over multiple passages in labs, suggesting that, yes, this is actually a stable state, uh, not just a transient uh, metastable phenotype. Then we further quantified this in multiple different cell lines working with our collaborators at Duke University. We looked at um, breast cancer, looked at prostate cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. And in all those cases, we observed that there was this heterogeneity. Some cells were expressing only vimentin, some were expressing only e cadherin, and some of them were expressing both together. Another set of experiments which was done uh, independently by other colleagues in the field, they actually segregated these three uh, phenotypes, similar to the experiment I showed you earlier about X, uh, a molecule X. So you segregate these three phenotypes and then just let them stay in culture. You don't induce anything you still see that they switch. So epithelial cells uh, over a period of two weeks, uh, this population, only 80% of the cells stay epithelial, the remaining 20% have switched. So all these three things actually validated multiple different assumptions, uh, multiple different, sorry, predictions that we uh, are model made at that point in time. So then we started asking, okay, if hybrid cell state exists, so what? What's, what is its functional consequence? And at that point of time, again, there was a lot of confusion in the literature about what is the connection between EMT and tumor initiation potential. So when, or, or in other words, stemness. So when cells undergo EMT, does their tumor initiation ability necessarily go up, go down, does not change? There was not a very clear answer. So we again did a similar approach. We identified what molecules uh, play a crucial role in determining the ability to form tumors, how they connect to EMT. And what our model predicted was that this was a non-monotonic response. So initially, when cells underwent EMT, their stemness increased. But if you continue to undergo EMT, the stemness will eventually decrease. So there is a stemness window, which is right there in between sitting at very close to hybrid cells. And when cells are there, they are much more likely to form tumors. This is a prediction we made in 2014. And there have been uh, many papers since then in multiple different cancers in vitro, in vivo, and even clinical literature that I'll come to in a minute that has validated that yes, indeed, this is what is happening. Uh, and cells which are somewhere in between are actually the ones which are most metastatic, most stemless, most plastic, most, uh, in many cases, most invasive as well. So this is data from skin tumors. This is data from prostate, sorry, um, breast cancer also that has been uh, published. So then we started asking, uh, when I moved here, uh, you know, back to India, started looking at some of these questions what is the relevance of these hybrid EM cells in terms of can they evade drugs as well? Can they evade immune system? And one fundamental question, why are they more plastic? They are more plastic that multiple people have shown it, but why so? What is the reason uh, behind that? So this is uh, work done by Sarthak and Sonali, both undergraduate students at that point of time in the lab. What they did is looked at the network uh, that I presented to you earlier, and included in it uh, a molecule called PDL1, which is a measure of how immune evasive this particular cell is going to be. The higher the level of PDL1, 
these are inhibitors, so they should be able to resist the attack being made by T cells. So we did simulations uh, of this network over very parameter ranges. And what we predicted was that when cells have entered their hybrid nature, hybrid EM phase, their PDL1 is high enough, uh, comparable to what is there in mesenchymal. So in other words, if cells have undergone only a partial transition to being a hybrid cell that is sufficient uh, to evade the immune system. Then we looked at uh, multiple different cell lines. This is data from uh, breast cancer cell lines in CCLE. And where you see that the levels of PGL1, again, uh, in the hybrid cell lines are actually higher than that in mesenchymal, but not much uh, actually comparable to that in, uh, in, sorry, higher than that in epithelial, but comparable to that in mesenchymal. To convince ourselves further, we took this data uh, and then looked at whether now if you do uh, fit a curve, uh, for how PDL1 signature changes as a function of EMT. Is it continuously increasing or does it saturate? So we fit a Michaelis Menten like curve, which is similar to what you see here in panel C, which is a, what our prediction of the model is. You see a better fit as compared to what you see from a linear curve. We looked at other data sets also, which were uh, existing at that point of time. And what we saw was that in cases when EMT was induced, you see that the levels of uh, these EMT inducers go, went up, the levels of PDL1 also went up, um, but when MET was induced, you saw that the levels of PDL1 coming down. So which clearly shows that these changes are reversible in, in nature. We looked at data sets where this uh, data was present for the same set of cells as well. These are two different experiments. So uh, here, as you can see, these are prostate cancer cells. When EMT was induced, uh, using overexpressing of snail. So when they went from day zero to day five, both the EMT as well as PDL1 levels go up. And as they come down, the EMT as well as PDL1 levels go down again. We further wanted to look this more carefully. So we looked at single cell data, which had now uh, come up in the field uh, in, in the past two years. So here EMT is induced in three different cell lines using four different inducers and at different time points as well. So this is a dream data uh, for us to see how the dynamics is and map that trajectory. So what you see here again is that when cells undergo EMT, so as you compare from zero to day to seven day treatment, so this is zero day. And when you induce the TGF beta for seven days, uh, you see that the epithelial score, which is the X axis decrease, the mesenchymal score, which is the Y axis increases, each dot is a cell. And when the signal was withdrawn, you see that only the uh, epithelial score changes, the mesenchymal score actually does not change, right? So these are different manifestations of EMT that are beginning to happen now. So you can see that PDL1 signature continues to increase and then it begins to come down. The same thing happens uh, when it, the change happens only along one axis. So if only the mesenchymal program is changing and not the epithelial, we still see an increase in PDL1. So just think similar to what we were saying earlier, that partial EMT or hybrid phenotype is sufficient uh, in terms of evading the immune system. The other question about drug resistance. So uh, when, when we talk about drug resistance, we have to be very specific as to which cancer and which drug are we talking about. So we started looking at ER positive, uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients. Estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is the most common form of breast cancer. And um, this is where the first targeted therapy was developed, uh, tamoxifen, which is given to these patients. So the, there were some reports in the literature about how EMT and resistance to tamoxifen are connected. But we wanted to get a more mechanistic understanding of what molecular changes are actually causing these uh, resistance. And is it bidirectional that when cells undergo EMT, do they gain tamoxifen resistance? And vice versa, when cells gain resistance to tamoxifen, do they also undergo EMT? And what about the hybrid cells? So a similar approach will put together a minimal regulatory network. Of course, there are many, many more players which are coming in and going to influence the dynamics of this network. But we wanted to start with a simple network similar to what we had done 10 years ago in the context of EMT. So what our model predicted here, x-axis is the EMT score, y-axis is the resistance score. Each dot is a simulation cell in this particular case. What we see is that yes, when cells are epithelial, they are much more sensitive. When cells are mesenchymal, they are much more resistant. But in between, the hybrid cells can also gain uh, resistance to these cells as well. So we went back to publicly available data sets um, where EMT was induced in breast cancer cell lines. 
So you can clearly see that in all these different cases, no matter how EMT is induced by overexpressing whichever transcription factor or treating with uh, TGF beta, EMT profile goes up, which is what the those corresponding papers have reported, and the estrogen response comes down. The other case where the estrogen response was silent, which is what happens, silenced, which is what happens in the non resistance, you see EMT goes up. And then when cell lines, or resistant cell lines are developed, you again see the same pattern that shows up there. So what this tells us is that, yes, this network is capable of explaining all this data put together, that these processes are governed in a bi-directional manner. These are two knobs of the system. And if you turn any one of them, the other automatically sort of gets, gets turned on. So this begins to uh, a question which we started with of how different axes of plasticity are connected to each other uh, and how are cells adapting simultaneously. So what this tells us is that if cells have undergone EMT, they have, they have killed two birds with a stone. They have gained the property to move. At the same time, they have also gained the property to evade uh, drugs and also evade the immune system. Now, what is the clinical relevance of any of this, right? So there have been uh, reports, uh, these are from breast cancer patients, primary tumors, where people actually quantified how many such hybrid cells exist. And the maximum number of such hybrid cells was seen in the most aggressive form of breast cancer called the triple negative. Then there were uh, pathology reconstruction of um, tissue biopsies taken across multiple different cancers and which have consistently shown that actually single cell migration is extremely rare in cancer and the cells which are usually at the periphery at their beginning to move, they do co-express epithelial and mesenchymal markers. So they are in a hybrid state. The most recent data was this one where they quantified how many cells in a tumor can, can be called as hybrid cells. And you would see the clear difference here that as long as you have only 2% of these hybrid cells, you the patients will have much worse survival, both in terms of overall survival as well as in terms of disease-free survival. So even a small percentage of hybrid cells is sufficient to wreak havoc uh, when it comes to the aggressive behavior of cancer. So that was the first aspect. The other question we started thinking was, was why are hybrid cells more plastic? Why do you see these kinds of behavior consistently across different experiments that have come out in the past 10 years? So then we started looking at much larger EMT networks which, which people have been uh, constructing. And you would see a very clear pattern here, which I'll try to highlight. So here in blue are the EMT inducing factors. In red are the MET inducing factors. What you see that when it comes to connections between these blue, they are usually activating each other, shown by green arrows. When it comes to connection between these uh, epithelial players, they're not activating each other. But when it comes to connection between the epithelial players and the mesenchymal players or the mesenchymal players impact on epithelial players, there is mutual repression, which is very similar to, again, ZEB and MIR200 inhibiting each other. This is just a much larger version of this. So then we started thinking of it in terms of two teams of players. There's an epithelial team of players, there's a mesenchymal team of players. They are pulling the cells in opposite direction and whichever team is stronger, the phenotype will be pulled in that particular direction. So then we quantified this further. We said, maybe we are just getting carried away. Let's, let's do this more seriously. So what we did in this network is we quantified the connection between any two nodes across all different paths that exist uh, for a given path length. And you can clearly see in this uh, figure here, G11 or G22, which is the impact of an epithelial player on another epithelial player on a, or a mesenchymal player or another mesenchymal player. They are all activating each other, shown in red. But when you look at the impact of a epithelial player on a mesenchymal player or the other way around, they are inhibiting each other. So this is very clear. Next, we asked, maybe this is just a spurious uh, result doesn't mean anything. So we then took this network and just as one would shuffle a deck of cards, we shuffled this network and created many, many um, non-biological random hypothetical networks and asked, do they also show themes? If they do not, then we can say that this formation of themes is something very specific to EMT. So we did this and the, the answer we found was that they do not show themes. So these have been quantified. The team strength is on a scale of zero to one. The red line is the wild type case. Everything else is 
histogram of thousands such random networks and, and you can clearly see that the wild type network has much stronger teams. So then we ask, okay, if they have teams, so what? What is the consequence or functional impact of these teams? So we took every single node in our network and perturbed one at a time, two at a time, many, many such things. And ask the question that if you start from an epithelial phenotype or a mesenchymal phenotype versus if you start with a hybrid phenotype, in which case would you exit that phenotype the earliest? And the answer is very clear here. If you are an epithelial or mesenchymal, you need approximately 40% of the nodes in the network to be disrupted so that you can stop being an epithelial or stop being a mesenchymal. But if you are in a hybrid state, five to 10% perturbation is sufficient. So this tells us that yes, the hybrid cells are more vulnerable to changing their phenotype, even given smaller perturbations around in their, uh, in their environment. This we further quantified it and then showed that this is a feature very specific to these uh, biological networks. And if you do this in a random network, this, then this feature is lost. So long story short, what we found was that the reason why hybrid cells are more plastic is because there is no team supporting them. The teams either support epithelial or a mesenchymal phenotype and the poor hybrid cells are stuck in between and they would get pulled one way or another. And these teams also uh, ensure controlled enthusiasm because you need 40% perturbation for an epithelial cell to exit an epithelial state or a mesenchymal. And question is the binary and the answer is no and also Uh, this is not my uh, it's an undergraduate student. Well, I think we, uh, can you hear us? Yes, can you it hear me now? Yeah, it got disconnected. Okay, I was on this slide, right? I'll just share. Yeah, in empty states, yeah. Am I back on this slide? Yes, yes, oh, okay. we can see Thanks. it now. Thanks, Thanks. Yes, so uh, this is another instance we started looking at in melanoma, where again, there was literature on switching uh, between proliferative and an invasive state. This is work uh, led by my student Malvika. And there was also reports on how drug treatment itself can induce uh, a cell state change. And just as the field of EMT has explored and we now know there are many states in between, the field of melanoma also over the past uh, decade or so has reported that there are additional states in um, addition to what were initially thought about as a binary process of proliferative and invasive states itself. So again, the similar questions, what networks control their switch? Melanoma is a highly aggressive cancer as many of you may know it. There is targeted therapy that is available uh, but very low uh, five-year survival rate. And there are reports now, uh, there were clinical reports earlier of relapse, but now there are in vitro and in understanding of the molecular processes as well as to when you treat cells with BRAF inhibitors or MEK inhibitors, uh, what uh, molecules get, what programs get activated such that the cells can eventually come back um, and what programs maintain what is called a minimal residual disease uh, in the case. Okay, so very similar questions we started with, what networks underlie cell state switching? What are the dynamics of this network? And can this network also explain the resistance features uh, seen in response to remidafinib? So Malvika started with the experimental data here, proliferative and invasive samples, identified list of co-expressed genes, and eventually through a pipeline that she established, identified this network, which contains transcription factors that are pushing the cell either to be more proliferative or being more invasive with all these uh, inhibitory and activatory connections among them. So what did we find? We find that if you simulate this network, you actually see four phenotypes and you can classify these four phenotypes as two sets of two phenotypes each, which would clus uh, cluster as proliferative and invasive. And then within proliferative or within invasive, there can be these sub-states uh, that can exist. 
again, our model predicted that if you look at these players involved in these self-help decision making, you should see that one set of players is positively correlated to each other. And so is this other smaller set of players, but they themselves are negatively connected to each other, which is what we saw experimentally as well. Again, supporting the idea of teams regulating phenotypic plasticity in melanoma. There was this in vitro data where cells when treated with remiracinib were shown to switch their phenotype over approximately two and a half months. So again, it depends on what time scale experiment we're talking about. Cells can switch at all different time scales. And we asked this question, can our model explain this? And we took our model, we mimicked this experiment because this uh, drug actually um, effectively knocks down MITF. So we knocked down MITF in our simulation and saw what was the change in the frequency of the four phenotypes that I just talked about. And we did see that the melanocytic profile went down, which is what you see here in this particular case. And there was an enrichment of other profiles that our model was able to explain. Now, we are also currently looking at, uh, because there is single cell data available from individual patients, we are trying to quantify in a given tumor, in a given patient, how many cells are invasive, how many are proliferative, and how many of them belong to additional cases. And we are trying to connect whether this phenotypic heterogeneity patterns can be connected as to which patient will likely have more aggressive versus uh, less aggressive responses. So summarizing these two stories, what we have seen so far is that cell state transitions are not binary. The, these networks are multi-stable as a consequence of which you can see cell state switching and you can also see coexistence of these multiple states. And in both these cases, there are teams of players which are shaping how cells will switch, how cells will not switch. And because these multiple states exist, when cells face um, a, a stressful condition such as a drug, they can switch to another state which is uh, resistant to drug or which the drug will not be able to kill as effectively. And once the drug is removed, these cells will come back and depopulate the tumor. Third and very quick example, small cell lung cancer, highly, highly aggressive cancer, less than 7% rate of five year survival. And we know that across all different patients of SCLC, these two mutations are commonly seen. So then what explains the patterns of phenotypic heterogeneity? of phenotypic plasticity or multiple different subtypes. If mutations are the same, then what is different? If the genetic profile is the same, then what is different? And there was again literature approximately five years ago where we now know that this is not a binary process. Uh, there can be cells, initially it was classified as a binary process, neuroendocrine or non-neuroendocrine, but now we know that there can be additional uh, subcategorization that can also happen. And this was again work led by two undergraduate students in the lab uh, Laksha and uh, Uday coming from biology and physics major, uh, respectively. We had a similar network. We didn't construct this network. This was already published um, in a uh, paper by Dito Quaranta's lab. And we simulated the dynamics of this network and asked similar questions that we have been talking about. So what we saw was that in this particular network, if you simulate this, you get predominantly only four states, which was very surprising to us. It's a, highly complex network and we were expecting somewhere around a million states to emerge out of it, but we got only four states. And again, similar to that shuffling, uh, card shuffling experiment, we generated multiple random networks and none of those random networks showed any of these four states and those random networks, most of those random networks showed the, the approximately million states which we were expecting. So here X axis is the logarithm of the number of uh, states and the y-axis is how the, it's a histogram, the number of networks that showed that behavior. So you can see approximately um, 300 networks actually had uh, 10 to the power five to 10 to the power six states, which is what we were expecting, but not this particular biological network. And these four states are unique to this particular network. So again, we saw the evidence of teams there. And when you find those teams, you can actually reduce this network to a much smaller network and this gives the same results than this uh, larger network as well. Again, what our model predicted is that there are these 22 players positively correlated with each other, 11 players positively correlated with each other. Among each other, they are negatively correlated, which is what we saw in experimental uh, data as well. And using these two markers, ASCL1 and Neurod1, which are very well studied in SCLC, we were able to explain the four phenotypes uh, that this, uh, 
these networks can actually give rise to. Okay, so I'll just summarize what we have seen in these multiple uh, cases is that no matter which instance you look at EMT, SCLC, or melanoma, there are multi-stable transcriptional networks. Of course, there can be heterogeneity at epigenetic level, metabolic level, et cetera, et cetera. And we are working to incorporate uh, those axes of uh, regulation as well. But even at a transcriptional level, there are multiple cell states available and cells can switch back and forth and have this heterogeneity patterns uh, as well. These networks can explain adaptive response to drug treatment as well. And the way we are thinking about these networks is that these can be platforms to predict which combination of therapies can be given and which sequence can they be given so that the drug induced switching can actually be minimized. And then we figure out the design principles of these networks that there are teams in these and these teams are there to stabilize specific phenotypes. I'll just end with this thought. So we all hear about uh, hallmarks of cancer, the 10, the 15, at this point, I'm actually confused what is not a hallmark of cancer, but nonetheless, all these hallmarks that we think about, we think about them uh, in, in a very static manner, but there have been instances where uh, the linear thinking about let's target a hallmark and cancer will take care of itself has not worked. The example being anti-angiogenesis therapies, which were given in early 2000s. And what was found was that patients who were actually receiving these therapies were having a worse outcome than patients who were not receiving these therapies. And now we know the reason for that was, uh, or at least a major reason for that, was that when you are depriving cancer cells of nutrients and oxygen by blocking angiogenesis, you are actually promoting metastasis. So cancer is a highly complex adaptive uh, system, and we should get out of this mode of thinking of it as a very static system, waiting for us to uh, you know, give our drug and then everything will take care of itself. You need to think about collecting data at multiple uh, dynamic profiles and then making your decisions uh, accordingly. So cancer is a complex dynamic adaptive system and therefore it needs to be respected uh, accordingly. And mathematical models can play an important role in this entire process because that's what mathematical models have done in decoding various other complex systems, be it weather prediction, finance, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to end with thanking the fantastic set of collaborators, uh, both experimental and clinical, who have had the fortune to work with, and also the colleagues on the more quantitative side of things coming from physics, chemistry, and math background, who have helped us um, achieve this understanding of where we are. And with that, I'd like to thank you for all your attention and thank all my students and colleagues here who have been fantastic companions in this journey so far. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Mohit, for that fantastic talk covering hybrid EMT states and how they can impact uh, drug resistance. And, and I agree with you, cancer is indeed a dynamic system and you have coupled the computational studies to quantitate some of these cell biological phenomena is what we need in order to better understand uh, cancer. Uh, we have got a few questions. So if you allow me, I can read them out for you. And I have some of my uh, own questions as well. Uh, so I'll go with first question by Sean Charigorai. So it's an exciting talk. I'm wondering in case of triple negative breast cancer, Generally, drug resistance is shown very frequently. Have you noticed any remarkable changes in stemness and EMT regulating PDGL1? Right, so that, that's a great question. So in triple negative breast cancer, uh, yes, the drug resistance features and stemness features, they all come together, uh, making the disease a much more aggressive one. And from whatever I have seen in the literature, the triple negative breast cancers uh, are more mesenchymal-like, uh, or are more progressed along the EMT axis as compared to the luminal A, luminal B, uh, or you know, uh, hormone receptor positive ones. We have not looked at triple negative breast cancer so far very closely, but we have uh, a recent collaborator with whom we are beginning to dissect this plasticity and heterogeneity further. We have looked at inflammatory breast cancer, which is uh, somehow connected to triple negative breast cancer. And there also we did observe that uh, patients who were doing worse uh, or patients who had an IBC-like profile uh, had a higher heterogeneity along the EMT axis. So we often talk about the mean differentially expressed genes. These genes are upregulated or downregulated, but we rarely talk about variants. 
and i think that's an important uh, component which we are missing uh, that can also be used to segregate patients uh, for their response later you're right so the next question from hasati uh, can epigenetics drive metastasis or emt met dynamics this is an excellent question i i didn't have the time to go into that data today but we are now coupling our transcriptional networks with epigenetic overlaying epigenetic information on them and if, what we have seen so far is that epigenetic changes uh, can play an important role in controlling the rates of transition so uh, you know again we talk mostly about bulk studies today but uh, there are studies now where epithelial cells were taken uh, where a given cell line was taken and single cell clones were established out of that cell line and they are epigenetically different uh and that epigenetic difference in many cases associates with whether they will undergo emt or not or whether they will undergo emt or not so epigenetics plays an important role in giving resistance to emt or changing the rate of progression of emt as well as emt all right so i'll go to the next question by deepa puri excellent talk mohit i'm wondering how these epithelial state and mesenchymal state and plastic state cells interact with both adaptive and innate immune systems for example are some of these states better capable of escaping t cells response so very good question the only um, investigation we have done in detail so far is with connection to pdl1 where we do see that when cells undergo partial or complete transition the pdl1 levels go up uh, which uh, then plays an important role in mediating their response to cytotoxic cells uh, we are currently looking into constructing more comprehensive models where we have immune cells also in our uh, simulation framework the progress we have made so far is by having macrophages of m1 and m2 polarization and m2 polarization macrophages can induce emt as we know from the literature m1 can induce met and epithelial and mesenchymal cells based on their secretome can also change the m1 m2 profile so again it, it's like a it's like a gene network now but now the nodes are not uh, genes but the nodes are cells and they are influencing each other's behavior so that is uh, some models that we have begun to look at and uh, we have some preliminary results there which we are validating in pcga right now right okay You know the question from Shireen Sultan does the phenotypic plasticity drive the non-genetic heterogeneity or is it the other way around So that that's that's a good question I'm glad that 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 was asked so people often get confused between uh plasticity and uh, heterogeneity and it's, uh, it sometimes gets used synonymously so heterogeneity can exist irrespective of plasticity yes but plasticity can definitely aggravate um uh, heterogeneity by giving rise to multiple uh, by giving rise to cells lying in multiple states so heterogeneity can exist independent of plasticity uh, but this is a major accelerator of process right okay uh, I'll, i'll ask a, a question from uh, from a very developmental perspective so you have showed about this hybrid emt state uh, using cancer cell line and and tumor uh, samples but emt is also important during development so do you still see the same hybrid em em states uh using uh, using data from the embryogenic embryogenesis right. that's a great question uh shanak the instance where we have looked so far more closely is uh, neural crest because we are now uh trying to connect melanoma plasticity to emt um which is work done by malvika and gauri and where we do see evidence that the neural crest like state is more hybrid so at least in neural crest and then there are some literature some papers on uh, terminal end buds during mammary morphogenesis uh, and those cells also have been proposed to be hybrid they co-express epithelial and mesenchymal markers they show collective behavior uh, collective migration patterns which are usually the hallmark of hybrid states so in those two instances uh, i have seen some papers indicating that possibility absolutely uh, i think so the my, my follow up question is can you distinguish the hybrid em states in embryogenesis versus during metastasis or tumor genesis right so we are still trying to understand how many states exist and what the different uh, phenotype i mean 
what the different properties of those different states are. So what we are doing now is um, instead of thinking of EMT as a one-dimensional process, we are now looking at uh, epi change in epithelial and change in mesenchymal properties separately. We often assume that they are happening simultaneously, that when epithelial goes down, mesenchymal goes up or vice versa, but that is not always the case. You can only decrease epithelial or only increase mesenchymal and that's also EMT. So we are trying to figure out how many such possibilities exist um, and are there differences in patterns seen in development versus that in cancer. Then we'll be able to say, uh, are there different kinds of hybrid cells? Are there different trajectories that they are taking? And then are there potential differences in their functional aspects? Well? Now that's very exciting. Uh, I'll go to the last question uh, by Alberta. Oh, yeah, there is a couple of more questions coming. Yeah, so anyone wants to post more questions, please feel free. With the time we have, I think I'll, we'll be able to do it. So Albert has a question, how do you see this information being incorporated into cancer treatment by doctors in real time? Sorry, can you please repeat that? Uh, how do you see this information, like all these mathematical models uh, being incorporated into cancer treatment by doctors in real time? Right, so great question. Um, so what I didn't go into too much detail, but I touched upon is that say tamoxifen treatment can induce EMT. So now if we are talking about, uh, and those EMT cells are resistant to tamoxifen. So the drug treatment itself is, cause, is killing a bunch of cells, sure. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. It's promoting some cells to switch to another state which it cannot kill. So now if, if what we have proposed, and this is experiments ongoing in our collaborators lab, that if you give tamoxifen together with MET inducers, then what you're doing is that whatever cells get pushed off to being more mesenchymal as, as a side effect of the drug, they are also back pushed back to being epithelial by this extra agent that we are doing. So th that is the kind of information, combinatorial information in a rational manner uh, that I think that these models can play an important role. I think with that, the combinatorial drug, drug therapies are also uh, being proposed in the market now. Right. So a question from Bazel Ashraf. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, sir. I had a few questions. Uh, for the graph on LX and HX populations where LX subtype alone gives rise to HX, is it then safe to presume that the initial heterogeneous composition is necessary for the cells to survive? Yes, yes, because that's when... Uh some cells will be left behind and then they can give rise to other cells, yes. And she has a, a follow-up question. While there is conclusive evidence on hybrid EM cells, would it be that there is a simultaneous presence of full EMT as well? And then situation where complete EMT overrides hybrid or not based on contextual differences? Right, right. So definitely, uh, I'm not saying that hybrid is the only form of EMT that is happening. Cells are undergoing full EMT. Uh, from whatever has been shown so far, uh, in at least in breast cancer and in um, to some extent in squamous cell carcinoma as well, that when cells undergo complete EMT, they lose some of the advantages they had in hybrid EMT. So they are still metastatic, but their metastatic propensity is not as much. Right. And maybe you have already uh, discussed this during your talk, but uh, I, I remember you showed uh, data from breast cancer cell line and uh, lung cancer cell line. And, but are these hybrid EM states pretty much similar between the different cancer types? Like what do you see it in, in actual patient samples, patient data? Do you see they are the same type of hybrid EM states or it depends on a lot of other genes and uh, other mechanisms? So, so far, we have only done transcriptomic analysis, and there it seems to be some uh, good amount of similarity there. Uh, we are now getting into other layers of regulation, such as uh, metabolomics, proteomics, and epigenomics, to see uh, whether there are differences at that regulation level. And if yes, then which ones are the ones that we should go after when it comes to therapeutic factor? Right. No, with that, thanks a lot, Mohit. It's a fantastic talk, and thanks for uh, answering so many questions by our audience. And thanks to our audience for tuning in and asking these fantastic questions. Uh, with that, uh, we are at the end of uh, to the session. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank Dr. Mohit Kumar Jolly for taking the time off uh, from your busy schedule and uh, discussing your work on our platform.
especially on a Sunday uh, evening. So thanks a lot for doing this. Our best wishes to you, you and your lab. You. Looking forward to more discoveries. Thanks a lot. Thank you.